So last talk, uh, Yicha and Harrison are going to talk about uh, rewrite.jl. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to our talk. Um, I'm Yicha. And I'm Harrison. And we're going to talk about algebraic simplification using rewrite. So the goal of rewrite is to simplify algebraic expressions using custom identities, so in specialized domains. Um, we want to have canonical rewrite systems so that we're able to ensure that every expression has exactly one normal, most simple form. And we'll demo this in a few different domains. Um, so we're going to explore ma mainly three domains to show that it works in, multi uh, in specific domains. So uh, we're doing Boolean algebra, standard algebra, and abstract algebra. So um, first, you want to import rewrite. From here, you get access to the term macro, which converts Julia expressions to rewrite terms. So you'll see right here, um, it displays using the term syntax so that you're able to easily copy and paste. You can use standard Julia functions on terms. So for example, you can collect a term to get its arguments, and you can parse it back to a standard Julia expression as well. So we're going to start with Boolean algebra. Um, so here's an expression in, um, in Boolean algebra, x or false or true and x. And um, so now it's compiling, it's making the rules. Um, this is an issue we'll fix. Um, it, the first time it will be kind of slow. So as you can see, it normalizes to the term x. Um, so the next expression um, turns to false. Uh, you'll realize it, uh, it doesn't matter what x is, it will always turn to false um, because of the normalization. And finally, this long term gets reduced to not y and x. Cool. So now we're going to move on to standard algebra. This is probably the algebra that you expect to hear um, about when you hear the term algebra. So um, first, we're going to normalize a pretty basic expression, negative 1 times x plus 0. And we get the expected negative x. Um, we can go for a more complex example. And once we normalize this, the first half of the term turns into just a 4. And we get 4 log n. And we can also do differentiation. So this is using the diffrules.jl API, and we're converting those rules to our format so that we can do something like diff x squared plus 5x with respect to x. So you'll notice this is a pretty long result that you get, and this is intentional. And the reason that we end up with all these ones and zeros is because, by default, rewrite does not infer the type of the variable. However, if we use special sets to specifically denote x as a numerical value, then we can normalize this differentiation and get the expected 2x plus 5. We can also normalize f of x plus sine x squared with respect to x using the same interpolated x. You'll notice uh, the sine x, um, sine x squared normalizes to the expected 2x cosine x squared. But because rewrite doesn't know about this function f that I told it about, then it will just leave it in differentiated form. So um, some expressions are better redu are reduced further when um, some of its arguments fit in a certain constraint set. So for example, if you have um, absolute value, um, absolute value of a non-negative term will reduce to the term itself. So for example, in this case, we have um, x squared, which is guaranteed to be non-negative, um, which yields uh, x squared. And similarly, when we have a negative term, um, it will reduce to 3 to the x, which is the term. Um, and also, when, it, when the term um, cannot be inferred to be either positive or negative, um, it will just stay the form as is, absolute value of sine of x. And you can certainly apply constraints to many other functions than absolute value. We're just giving an example. So a lot of functions have implicit properties that help us normalize. The two that we're going to talk about are flat and orderless. So you might have heard them by associative and commutative. So I'm going to quickly just um, use this context um, syntax, and we're going to create a context where f is guaranteed to be flat. And you'll see whenever I generate this term using all these nested f's, then it just flattens all of that down because it allows us to match as if it's an associative term. Similarly, we have this rule here, um, f of x plus g of x is normalized to h of x. And we can apply this to g of x plus f of x, and it will understand that due to the orderlessness of plus, then it can still normalize to h of x x. And finally, for a more real world example, we have two cosine x, sine x, where the cosine x and sine x are in a quantity parentheses. Um, multiplication is always flat. However, it knows here that sine, cosine, and 2 are all supposed to be constants, uh, numerical constants. So it understands that commutativity does exist, and we can get sine 2x. So now we're going to move on to group theory and how normalization is done there. 
So um, group theory is a classic example for completion, um, which basically is um, a set of axioms turned into a set, a canonical set of rules. Um, and here um, on the screen is a uh, lexical graph of path order, which is a reduction order. And what it basically means is um, identity, which is represented as E, is more preferred than times, and which is more preferred than I. Um, so uh, we're going to quickly empty the context as well so that we don't have the built-in associativity of multiplication. Oh, so I, is e. ah. oh uh, I is the inverse of an argument, and E is the identity. Yep. Just function names. Um, and here's the set of axioms. Um, the first one uh, is assuming that we don't have the, um, the flat property, but eventually we will um, have it attached. And the next two are just the basic rules for group theory. Perfect. Axioms. Um, so this is an example of critical pair, which is required for completion. What it basically means is you have a term, and when it's normalized by two different rules, it generates two different outcomes. So for example, rule one, uh, um, one rule will turn it into um, negative x plus quantity x plus y, and then the um, rule two will convert it into pl uh, zero plus y, which then turns into y. So a rule must be defined from the left term to the right term, and in this case, because y is a more reduced form, um, we draw the arrow that way. And you repeat this process until all the, all the critical terms are turned into rules, basically. So now we can apply this completion procedure using the reduction order we talked about before and the axioms that we defined, and we get all of the derived properties from group theory. So you'll notice here's the rule that we were just talking about, but it derives some really interesting um, facts as well. For example, it noticed that the inverse of the identity is just the identity, the inverse of the inverse of any x is just going to be x, and the, um, the left identity also implies a right identity. Uh, so we can normalize this expression uh, with respect to group theory, as can we this, and you'll notice that um, given the axioms of group theory, these are correct normalizations. All right. Um, so um, due to the time limitation, we didn't um, talk about all the details, just the broad overview of a rewrite, um, but in case you want more details, come to talk to us. Um, and or on Friday on the poster session, um, we'll present a poster which contains much more information, diagrams and illustrations. If you're interested in learning more about Rewrite, using it or contributing, feel free to check out our GitHub repo. You should just be able to also uh, look up rewrite.jl. We should be the first result. Here are a couple references which were really useful in the development of Rewrite. Um, uh, can we take any questions? Um, uh, so you showed all these examples. Do, are, do you have a general framework, and then all of those came from the general framework, or were those three separate p uh, um, code bodies that you had to write? Yeah, so this is all a general framework. Just because of the um, time limitations, we only demoed in three specific domains which highlighted specific aspects. However, you're able to define a custom context with custom functions and custom rules, and everything will adapt to that new context. Yeah. Um, maybe following along the same line of question, uh, for uh, like complex like algebra, so I don't know, star algebra, um, is it already implemented? Are you planning to do that? Yeah. Um, thanks. Okay, so basically um, uh, the user can define any rules in a, in a specific domain. So say you want a complex algebra that's not quite explored and you have 10 rules for that algebra, then basically you add those rules. Um, you add, you just have to add axioms really, which are sort of like equations, um, and they're converted into rules, um, completed using critical terms, and um, any expression you give will be normalized based on those rules. Um, so it's really, what we develop is a general system um, for any domain, and we demoed with three, but yeah, it definitely can work with more. Uh, I'm gonna hijack the next question. So uh, what does the term macro boil down to? So what does it compile? Is it a, a proper structure you define or? Oh, oh, <laughs> yeah, great question. So uh, this is the structure of our types. Um, very straightforward variable has a name, an index, so for things like x1, x2, x3, uh, x3 
and image is the set which the variable falls in. Um, constant is just a wrapper for a con mathematical constants, and function has a name, um, sine, cosine, logs, and args, however number of arguments it has. You may be noticing that this is a pretty similar structure to the built-in expressions and symbols in Julia. That um, is something that we hope to explore soon, and it's possible that especially the last two structs could be refactored out, so we could support more general Julia expressions. However, these are used right now uh, mainly for dispatch. Sorry, going back to the complex algebra. I saw that absolute value of x squared is simplified to x squared, which is not true in general. Aha. So this is because is we copy? have yeah. this rule defined for the standard algebra. Um, if we head back here. Yeah. So we define all these rules that we're showing right now by default since we didn't provide the specific rule set to normalize in the standard algebra. However, as we showed uh, with the group theory example, you can absolutely normalize with respect to a certain set of rules and you can define more rules within our base library or outside. So, yeah. Question right there. Um, am I correct in remembering that both completion and many axiom systems are undecidable and that there's a sort of user beware uh, required here? That's a great question. Um, so actually we um, stumbled upon that and um, spent a lot of time on it. Um, basically, um, we use this algorithm called Newth Bendix completion. Um, so yes, yes, um, to have a canonical system, um, to have, uh, so basically have a expression turn into one unique normal form is undecidable. However, um, using Newth Bendix, um, you ha if you ha apply some constraints on um, the rules you give, um, it will actually complete the rule set um, and basically it's no ready to normalize. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. There are also some uh, future things that we can do involving termination checking on Newth Bendix. As long as the Newth Bendix completion procedure uh, terminates, then you know that you have a terminating and confluent, which is equivalent to canonical rewrite system. So we can do some checking, which is in future planned work, so that we'd be able to give you more of an insight as to whether or not we expect your given axioms to terminate. Are there some more questions? All right, let's thank the last speakers once again.